On to the 18th meeting of the Education Skills Committee in 2017. And can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting. Before we move to the first agenda item, I would like to place my thanks on record to Ross Thompson, who was a member of this committee from the start of the session and has resigned as an MSP to take up his new seat at Westminster. The first item of business is a decision to take items in private. This meeting, items three and four, are a review of the evidence we will hear in school infrastructure and consideration of a draft report on teacher workforce planning. Are members agreed that we take items three and four in private? Thank you. Similarly, are members content that the items to review oral evidence and school infrastructure on the 21st and 28th of June and any future consideration of the draft report on teacher workforce planning are in private? Thank you. The second item of business is the first uh, evidence session as part of the committee's inquiry into school infrastructure. This inquiry will focus on the lessons to be learnt from the incident at Oxgangs Primary School in January 2016, the inspection and remedial work of the school estate since early 2016, and the quality assurance practices for new school buildings. Today we will hear from Professor John Cole, who is the Chair of the Independent Inquiry into School Closures in Edinburgh, Ian McKee, who is the immediate past Chair of RICS in Scotland, Paul Mitchell from Scottish Building Federation and the Scottish Building Apprenticeship and Training Council, and Jim Thullis, General Secretary of SLS Scotland. Before I start, it is important to note that there is an ongoing fatal accident inquiry relating to the accident at Liberton High School in 2014, when very sadly a pupil died following the collapse of a wall within the school. We will therefore avoid discussions on the specifics of that accident to ensure that this committee does not impinge on the work of the FAI by exploring matters which may be sub judice. And I'm sure members will join me in expressing our condolences to Keane Wallace, Bennett's family and friends. I now move to questions. As usual, I'll start and I have a general question for Professor Cole. What are the main recommendations or conclusions of your report would you like to highlight to the committee? And specifically, what are the key lessons we should draw from the Oxgang Primary School incident? Um, there's a long version and a short version of the answer to that question, I'm afraid. <laughs> the long version is the 207-page yes. report. The shorter version we do fine. Please. The short version, I'm sure, will be more suitable to die. Um, the, the fundamental issue um, was the fact that there was no one with the responsibility on behalf of the client to ensure that what the client was procuring was procured to the standard that was required in the, uh, in the contract. Um, the uh, quality assurance within the project was, was failed. It could only fail with the level, and there's plenty of um, information within the report showing the tables of defects that were found across the schools. What um, amazed me um, in, in coming into the report was the fact that despite that there were six different contractors, main contractors involved in the 17 schools in Edinburgh, and they used different bricklaying subcontractors and different personnel within those companies, that the same basic faults occurred were found uh, to be evident across all schools to very much a similar degree. Um, only yesterday I was in London at a meeting and an architect came up to me and they had just found a wall in a full wall in a gymnasium at, in a school built last year. On the basis of this report, the contractor had come back to look at it and they found that there were no wall ties in the whole uh, large uh, wall, be a two-storey wall, which if it fell would, it, would equally be liable to kill people in the gymnasium or outside the gymnasium. Um, so this fault is probably not one limited to Scotland, um, but I can only speak about the evidence that I collected in relation to the inquiry which focused on the information I received from the Edinburgh Council, who were very, very helpful in relation to the, their openness, um, and the other local authorities to whom I, I wrote to ask for information in relation to their projects. The similarity of occurrences across all these schemes was, was absolutely quite amazing. Uh, lack of embedment of wall ties, lack of inclusion of header ties, um, lack of inclusion of bed joint reinforcement, fundamental and basic elements of the construction of walls that are essential to give them the stiffness they require to resist uh, wind loading in, in a range of specified conditions under the codes of the country. So the fact that nobody was watching that and that all the quality assurance systems of the contractors involved 
um, and the role of the independent tester, for example, in the PPP projects, somebody who, in theory, signed the buildings as being completed in accordance with the requirements. The fact that the, those roles, none of them were of sufficiently detailed or intensive a process to actually allow the client to be assured that the building was built in accordance with the specifications. The only way that that can be done is either by uh, having a clerk of works on site who would be there at such regularity and uh, of visits that he can actually um, see these elements before the walls are closed in, when they're, particularly when they're building walls, and on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, that element of uh, supervision, which was standard in previous procurement models, has now been in a large degree discarded by uh, public procurement processes, particularly with PPP, on the basis that there's a thought, um, as put about by quite a few legal advisors, that the client doesn't want to take responsibility for any contributing negligence by having his people look at the wall and comment on it and ask contractors to do anything. So you stand back and you let the builder do it. Well, the risk with that is that the builder may do it wrong because in times there's incentives, perverse incentives for contractors to actually not mark their own homework down and force them to rebuild walls, cause them extra money and delays, which can lead to liquidated damages, etc. So um, the, 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 the contractor will always give their own work the benefit of the doubt, whereas an independent scrutiny by others um, would allow that to be uh, captured. When a contractor knows a clock or work system site, I feel the attitude is different because they know that if they build something inappropriately, it will be marked and told to be rebuilt again. So the procurement models we have have created a gap of that detailed level of inspection. Um, the independent tester role is very much interpreted by clients as they will give me the assurance by the certification that the building has been completed satisfactorily. But the level of duties and, in fact, the fees they are paid allows them maybe to visit a site maybe once a month or not even that, and they see their primary role as commenting on progress, and ultimately was the building finished to look roughly like it did and were all the bits there, rather than to comment on the quality of construction and the detail behind it, which are fundamental to the safety of the users of the building uh, in the future. So we have a gap currently within the system whereby the client thinks the contractor's protecting me, thinks that the uh, architect working for the contractor is working on his behalf, uh, he thinks the independent tester has given him the credibility. And finally, as you'll see in the report, he thinks by having building control officers come out to the site that they're giving them that assurance. Well, the level of visits of building control officers has decreased very much over the years. Um, what was in the report is that about 90% of visits were relating to, to uh, uh, drainage issues and only one or two at the end were looking at the construction of the building. So they, they, they didn't see, and I think rightly so, as it's described within the uh, legislation, they didn't see it as their role to be uh, supervisors of the work of contractors. They're not. But the client, ultimately, they can, the, uh, the uh, City of Edinburgh Council in this case, they cannot delegate away responsibility to ensure that what they're procuring is a safe building for children and other users to be in. Um, and uh, therefore, they have to put appropriate steps to ensure that there's independent scrutiny that a contractor is actually delivering what he has promised to deliver, uh, rather than relying on that contractor to do it automatically. Um, the level of supervision should reflect the level of risk. And if having looked at 100% of these schools in Edinburgh and found that 100% of them failed, then that would require supervision on all of those schools until you find that, that is not the behaviour of the industry and that walls are being built safely, and therefore you can look at whatever the next risk, risk, risk issue is. None of us would actually pay a contractor for doing work in our kitchen without going around and looking to make sure that it was all finished before you paid him. But effectively, by stepping back from that as a client and saying, we don't want to take any risk in, in judging you, so you do it and it's over to you if it fails. The only risk is that if it fails in a way which is to do with the structure or another element which I picked up in the, in the, in the document, the fire safety of a building, um, if somebody is killed as a result of that, it's, it's fine that you've one person to sue, but at the same time you haven't uh, carried out your own uh, responsibilities in ensuring that what you procured was safe by taking appropriate measures. The current procurement systems have lost uh, those, those, uh, that role. There's now a gap of that detailed level of scrutiny. In uh, many cases, not in all cases, because some local authorities are still using uh, Clark Works, 
This has lots of issues to do with the change in the role of the professional, no longer representing the client but representing the builder. An assumption that that, that professional is still acting on behalf of the client when he, when he can only act on the contractor and in many cases is forbidden to talk to the client directly without the contractor's approval. Um, the fact that, that professionals cannot report and do not tend to report to clients directly when they see defects but report to the contractor and it's up to the contractor to decide whether he fixes that or not. Uh, so there are real gaps in the process. Good quality, uh, best principles in terms of how you manage projects and how you manage quality assurance can make any of the procurement systems work. It can make PPP work, it can make design and build work, it can make traditional construction work. But what we've done is we've changed the system, we've pulled back from the clients, the clients not wanting to take on that risk, and we've left a huge gap which... Um, can cause real, real problems, and I think will continue to cause real, real problems until something is done about it. Okay, thank you very much for that. That was a, 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 a very full answer. The, the, so somebody who worked in the building trade many years ago, the, the clerk of works was central to everything that was, was ever done, and I'm shocked to hear that it has such a minimal role, according to you. The, in, your, in your report, you conclude that the financing method itself wasn't the reason for the faults in construction. But you also say that while it wasn't responsible for the defective construction, aspects of the way in which PPC methodology was implemented in these projects did increase the risk of, of poor quality design and construction. So how do you marry them? What, what exactly do you mean by that, that statement? Well, the first statement is it really doesn't matter where the money comes from for a project if it, if it represents value for money. And we all know, we, most of us, I'm sure if you run the table, have had a mortgage to buy your house uh, because you don't have the money up front. And the City of Edinburgh Council, in my report, says it found itself in the position it couldn't repair its uh, buildings, um, which were in a really bad state. So it went to PPP, getting the money from the private sector. The source of the money, um, I don't think, is, is necessarily relevant to how you then manage the quality of delivery for the project. So um, the funding um, is there. Then from that point on, you say, well, what is the best principles in relation to the design quality and the construction quality, and what mechanisms do we need to have? So you can have clocker works in a PPP scheme. You can have um, uh, independent architects or independent design teams working for the client in a much more structured way. You can have proper quality assurance systems. Uh, those weren't there. Um, so the, the compatibility of um, good practice with PPP it's possible if it's done that way, but the trend and the nature and the way that PPP is done is that there's less and less contact between uh, client and professionals and design and the detail of the work. Um, so the, the way it's implemented is a problem as opposed to the fact that the money comes from a bank as opposed to from government. You know, the, the money is just simply the resource that pays for the goods. It's how they are procured and the detail of that procurement arrangements and the definition of roles, including appropriate quality assurance mechanisms. If those are built into all of those systems, then all of those systems would work okay. And I've used PPP very effectively in, on, on different occasions as well, although I tend not to use it. Yeah, but why then do you think that uh, in PPP, because that's what you're highlighting here, that it wasn't working, that uh, th there seemed to be this trend towards cutting costs or cutting Be corners. Because there's nobody on the client side checking that has been done to the level that they want. And because there has become this belief in clients that they don't want to be involved, they want to transfer risk to somebody else to provide it. And therefore, as, as, the, the benefit of doing that is, as in the case of the Edinburgh schools, if something goes wrong, they have to pay for putting it right. Whereas under a, a more traditional role, if something went wrong, they'd have to sue the architect, sue the design team, sue the contractors, find out who was to blame. Under PPP, the, the contractor doesn't get paid when the building isn't available. So that's a benefit of PPP in that if something goes wrong and you can't use it, they don't get paid for it, there is an incentive for them to fix it and they have to pay for fixing it, which is happening in the, in the Edinburgh case. But, but th th that's, that still doesn't uh, mean that you're getting buildings built, uh, built properly. The contractors come in, they build the buildings, and they sell them off. In this case, the original stakeholders were Amy and Miller Construction. Amy um, sold all the shares before the second phase of the 
uh, the, the schools was complete, and Miller shortly thereafter. Um, so contractors move their money through because they're builders of buildings rather than managers of buildings, and they sell on to, to funds and, uh, that, that, that buy into them. So all the equity holders now are not the people who originally were involved uh, in, in the scheme. So the contractor is in for a short while, and there was a belief with PPP that um, if it was a 30-year contract, when people built it, they would build it right. But in the uh, evidence given to my inquiry, when we asked the people involved in the FM side of things, and this project, who are Amy FM, they said that it was only lip service was paid to the, to the operator of the building in terms of when they were introduced into the process and their ability to influence the quality of design or construction. Uh, and that was, that was the premise on which PP was supported by many people, that because it was a 30-year contract and if it doesn't work, you don't get paid, they'll build it better. Well, clearly, that was not the case in this instance or in the case of the many other instances that we found. Uh, people did take shortcuts. Contractors make their money on what they pay out in terms of the cost of building. And if they can reduce that, um, the, the incentives for, for um, contractors to try and cover up work are unfortunately there. Now, the, many contractors wouldn't allow for that. And in fact, um, I think I've, I've been encouraged by recent conversations I've had with chief executives of some major contracting firms who've already said to me that as a result of the report, they have strengthened the level of on-site um, supervision that they are applying to brick working areas. And one company said they just appointed 20 brick line supervisors to work in the UK. Uh, across schemes. So there's a recognition in the industry too that things have gone wrong and I don't think there's any intent by the industry to do it that way. But effectively we've lost skills in the industry. Uh, we have people inspecting work who maybe come from more project management rather than construction background and maybe don't know what to look for when they're looking at works. We don't have a clerk at works with a specialist eyes on site. We don't have the professionals eyes on site because they're not paid to go on site in the way they were in the past. So you're not getting the professional inspection, you're not getting the clock of works inspection, to the same degree, and I'm talking about the, the generality rather than, than the totality, because there's still some very, lots of very good contractors and lots of, of people using very good practices, but this has become the dominant model where the client uh, advisors are now working, who used to be the client advisors, now working for the contractor. Yeah, well, ju just one last question before I, I pass it on to my colleagues. The, the, do, do you think then that the, the, the client should be, in, in terms of the procurement, the client should be, shouldn't be allowed to have that hands-off role, that they should, they should make sure that the clerk works or whatever, some sort of safety inspection yeah. model is in there? Ultimately, the client has to take all reasonable steps, the yeah. public body client, to ensure that what has been built is safe and complies with the building regulations that they, in the case of a council, are actually responsible for implementing and ensuring. Now, so what steps do you take to do that? Well, you take whatever appropriate steps you need. And I say the level of supervision should be proportioned to the risk of it not being done properly. Well, the risk of brick lane not being done properly has been shown to be a very significant risk. Therefore, you apply appropriate resources to ensure that that's happening. Contractors are telling you it's complete. Uh, the independent testers signed the certificates of these buildings saying they were complete. Building control gave completion certificates for those buildings that were signed. There are two or three of the schools never received completion certificates from building control and yet were opened. Um, but um, all of those certificates would tend to let a, an, a less informed client think that he's got a building which is completely safe. But so none of those sorry, processes can I just were come complete. In there, Professor Cole, you've just said something that, that kind of shocked me that some of them didn't even have the building certificate and were opened. Is that what you said? Yes. Oh, it's in, the, it's in the report. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's quite a big Sorry, section of the report. Right, OK, thank you very much. Uh, Liz? Uh, yes. um, Professor Cole, I find your uh, evidence um, very interesting, but also um, very depressing. And I, I'm interested in, you've given us a very articulate and very clear uh, view of what you think ought to happen to improve matters. Could I ask you not just about the actual building process and the oversight of that, but about the maintenance of school buildings. Because obviously local authorities in most cases have a responsibility on an ongoing basis to make sure that the buildings are fit for purpose. And I'm sure every parent across Scotland wants an absolute guarantee that their school building is safe. Could you tell us what you would see as the fundamental qualities that would be required in the maintenance process of inspection on an ongoing basis? What do we have to do across all local authorities 
across Scotland to ensure that we have got a robust maintenance and inspection on a regular basis of all our school buildings? Again, that could be a long answer, but I'll try and keep it brief. Um, the, the, strangely enough, PPP does put the level of money into maintenance to allow the buildings to be maintained properly. And you'll find a commentary based on the evidence given by people from Edinburgh Council themselves that because of the contractual arrangements, um, they have to pay the money to get the schools maintained. So whether the walls need painted every three years or not, they will be painted because that's the contract and they get paid for doing that. In the schools that they manage themselves, maybe because of the amount of money they're paying out on the PFI maintenance contract, they did not have the same resources. So their own schools, which are run by themselves and owned by themselves, were maintained to a much poorer standard. The evidence from the head teachers associated with the schools in question who had experience of both uh, the council-owned schools and the PPP schools said that from a maintenance perspective, the PPP schools were maintained better. Now, just to go back for a moment when you said it's maintenance to ensure that buildings are built properly, the problem with the, the, the problem associated with this issue, the main problem, the masonry uh, issues of building of the brick walls, is not something that's going to be found by maintenance uh, inspectors after the event. The inside of walls are no longer visible. And in fact, it was, uh, another issue is that you can't actually tell there's something wrong with the wall by walking around it from the outside once it's finished and seeing it. Uh, because that was the case, they inspected the 17 uh, schools here and said they were all okay from external examination. Only when they opened up did they find that so many fundamental elements were missing. So that can only happen when it's been built because if you close up something which is no longer accessible. So those elements need fundamental inspection at the time it's been built. The um, issue of the fire stopping is interesting in that the, uh, the, in the report you'll see that the contractor, Amy FM, told me that they did regular inspections of fire stopping. Now, fire stopping generally uh, um, is generally visible, sometimes hard to get at and, and, and hard to see, certainly depending on the nature of it. But uh, the number of defects that were reported in the schools were substantial across all the 17 schools again, and yet we were advised that they had been doing inspections on a regular basis. Now, the inspectors, when they're getting paid for it by a client, also have to have somebody inspecting the inspectors. You know, you don't rely on somebody you're paying to tell you, yes, everything's okay. So there needs to be an appropriate regime of council independent inspection. The words I've used time and time again is independent scrutiny. Don't let the person who's who's getting paid for it, tell you that everything is fine. Yeah. You need to have somebody else in uh, looking at that to give you the reassurance that you need. And again, the level of that independent scrutiny should be proportional to the risk and your experience and the areas of work that are more liable to uh, not being, being carried out safely. So the key element in the maintenance of buildings is having appropriate uh, regimes for long-term and cyclical maintenance and short-term maintenance and funding it properly. And unfortunately, I would say that most public buildings, and I say this as somebody who worked in mainly health for many years, building hospitals, etc., most public buildings fail miserably in terms of the level of maintenance funding that is applied to them during their, their life cycle. Okay. Uh, th that's all very interesting. I, I, and what you're effectively you're saying is that there has to be two components to the uh, inspection process, absolutely properly done uh, with scrutiny at the time of the building. Yeah. And then, secondly, on an ongoing maintenance uh, basis, yes. obviously with slightly different um, criteria there. Could I just ask you, do, do you feel that in the, in the second case, as it uh, comes across uh, the, the, the maintenance over a, a longer period of time, do you feel that within a school inspection process that it would be possible at the time of the school inspection to have the... Uh, authority from the construction company or the architect or whoever it might be to give a guarantee to the school that as well as their inspection in school terms being fit for purpose, the building maintenance has also been fit for purpose. Would that be a possibility? Um, I, think, I think every piece of work should have somebody signing off to say it's been done properly and that requires competence on the basis of the people who are doing it. This is another weakness in the industry, that many of the people signing things and certifying it do not necessarily have the competence in that area to speak knowledgeably about those issues. So what do we need to do to ensure that they do have that competence? 
It's about having a proper um, structured system which says, in relation to, for example, if something at the moment in relation to gas or, you know, you do have very particular um, um, requirements as to who inspects and who signs off alterations to a gas system or maintenance of a gas system. It has to be by a registered person. Whereas in relation to building, generally there's no requirement as to the level of competency which anybody can in and build. Anyone can call themselves a builder. Uh, the uh, the current regulations put the responsibility on the owner or developer to appoint somebody with the competence to do that, but there's no definition as to what that competence is because there's no standardisation, there's no licensing. People coming on site to build walls in times when there's a demand for bricklayers that you really don't know quite often who is coming on site and what qualifications they have. So my, my last point would be that your recommendation would be that we have higher professional standards and accreditation. Yes, but this is the other issue. If you want higher professional standards, you have to pay for them. And what has been cut uh, more and more and more over recent decades um, in terms to try and achieve efficiency is cutting out the processes which help guarantee the quality. And if you want a, a professional person to be there, you pay that professional person reasonable for the time. And if you're leaving it to the, co the contractor to decide how often a, an architect is going to come on and inspect their work and tell them that it's bad and have to do it again when they're working for them, when that person's paying them, there's a conflict of interest and there's a, an in, and in many of these, these uh, appointments, the architects or, or engineers are not appointed to actually carry out that supervision because the contractor doesn't want them to tell them what isn't correct. Yeah. Thank you very no, much. I'm not saying, um, yeah. I've contracted. I was going to ask if Mr Mitchell wants to come in. Mr Mitchell, would you, you get any comment you'd like to make? Yeah, I, I think um, in the construction industry at the moment, the, the main way to, to check um, an individual's credentials is through CSCS cards. So CSCS cards can only be obtained if they have a, a relevant qualification. Uh, and quite often you'll find that they are uh, in circulation on uh, larger construction sites. However, we still have a problem whereby local smaller contractors um, will simply uh, re receive a call from somebody who says they're, they're, they're a bricklayer, they'll say start on Monday morning and they'll know by first tea break whether they can hold a trowel or not or whether they can, they can perform. So we, we do still have um, issues of um, candidates entering the construction industry who don't have formal recognised uh, robust qualifications. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ross? Yes, convener. Professor Cole, just looking at the, the initial incident at Oxgangs, I wonder if you could explain the, the process of what happened immediately after that a little bit more. Uh, so there was the incident of uh, part of the, the cladding of the wall collapsing. The school was closed for three days. There was a visual inspection of the 16 other PP1 uh, schools, but the school was reopened. Two months later, that school as well as the, the other 16 were closed for a prolonged period of time because of further survey work that had revealed further issues. Now, to a layperson, that seems really concerning that the school was closed for three days and then reopened only to have further serious issues discovered and then closed for a prolonged period of time two months later. Would you be able to explain that process, how a school was closed due to a, a structural issue, then reopened, then closed again? I could tell you what happened rather than explain. Um, yeah. You know, um, and uh, what, what happened was the, the wall collapsed. Um, there was an immediate response, and the, uh, you know people were out very, very quickly. And the thing is, people saw a wall collapse. They knew that um, the uh, storm Gertrude had just happened, so they knew the the cause for it was the suction of the wind pulling that the outer face uh, off the wall. Um, they hadn't done the full calculation at that stage to understand precisely whether the construction of the wall had been up to the codes required, because. A wind exceeding the requirement of design for the codes would still cause a wall to fail, and you couldn't criticise people. You know, the wall could have been built properly if there had been a hugely extreme wall. So there's a process to go through to um, to identify what was the cause of the of the, the fault. Now the 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 engineers who came along and, and did that analysis um, also had to try and get the school. Uh, ready to be uh, to be used again and make sure that it was safe to, to do so in their minds. So they did a visual inspection 
and this you'll find what the report says about visual inspections of this school. And they said prudently enough, well, if these school, this school was built by, we'll just have a look at other walls to see whether this wind caused any bulging or cracking, which would be the normal signs of stress on a wall that might subsequently collapse. None of that was found in the other schools. But the report done by the uh, engineer said this requires further consideration. We'd recommend that that is done. So it was a, a report started, I think the incident was on the 29th of January. The report was completed on the 29th of February following um, um, inspections of the, uh, of the wall, intrusive inspections of the rest of the walls of that school. And it showed similar defects in terms of the he missing, head missing wall ties. It was only the wall ties at that point that were the subject of, of, of debate. Um, and the reasons that all the schools were closed was, was in the process of starting to refix the missing wall ties, um, it was noticed by one of the contractors that the header ties were not there. Now, I don't know whether you all understand the nuances. I'm sure some of you do. I'm sure some of you don't. But uh, if that's a wall panel, and um, this is a steel column, either side of it, and you had a steel beam across the top, if there's nothing fixing that panel to this, that, and that, then it's virtually like a freestanding panel. So when the wind comes to it, you know, it can suck it and blow it down both sides. Now, the, the wall also was a cavity wall, so you have an outer leaf and an inner leaf. The failure on the Oxygen School that was initially put down was the failure for this to be bonded adequately to the back leaf so the panel would act as a single panel. At that stage, they didn't realise that the inner panel as well had not been as required uh, to be tied back to the steel frame. So the requirement for freestanding panels like that to stop flipping about as I'm showing it is that this is tied with steel ties to the columns and to the steel beam above. What they subsequently found, by, almost by accident, when they started to repair the, the missing wall ties, was that many of the ties supposedly holding this panel to the steel beam at the top and making it rigid were missing. And that therefore would create the risk that not only would the outside face fall off, but potentially the inside wall could fall out or in. So only when that was discovered was the decision then subsequently made um, to close all the schools. Up to that point, the risk was felt could be handled in the fact that the fall would be only upwards and they were fencing off all those areas to protect them. So I think they moved as fast as they could with the level of information that was coming along. And the other thing to, to say, I was amazed, you know, as an architect who's, who's, who's been involved in um, three and a half billion pounds of work, um, I was amazed to find that the same incidents were happening with that level of frequency across 17 different buildings. No one could have thought that. They thought this was an isolated incident at the start and acted on that basis, but prudently they did look, and it's only by the fact that they did look and do this report on the 29th, then in the opening that up they found this second defect that they realised that they had to do something much more significant, which led to the closure of the schools. I totally accept what you're saying about it being a, an unprecedented scale of, of errors across multiple buildings. But is, is there an issue with the process there in that they agreed the codified process was followed, but that it was inadequate and that visual inspections were not adequate to, to identify what could have been wider problems and the process itself needs reviewed and strengthened? Well, what I've said in my report is that visual inspections should not be considered satisfactory. Yeah. Uh, so it's one of the recommendations in the report that nobody can assume because you, a wall looks straight from the outside that it is uh, built structurally well. And this comes back to the issue about maintenance. You can't tell this afterwards, and you can't go up digging holes in walls every now and again to check, because you can only see so much through a, you know, through a scope going into a wall. You really can only do this at the time you build it. And this comes back to the issue about a clocker works as the ears and eyes of an architect and the ears and eyes of a client on a site, watching what the contractor does and confirming that it's been done properly. That, that was the only answer, really, to this. Uh, just very briefly, on the point about the Corker Works, you'd said something earlier that I might have missed. I wasn't sure whether you're referring to the Corker Works, but saying that um, often they're uh, not allowed to go directly to the client. They have to go through the, the contract. No, no, that wasn't. That was the, the, the under design and build, which has become the predominant methodology used by public sector organisations, a method which I tend not to use because I prefer to have the professionals on my side, uh, and I always did that. 
But under that system, instead of the architect working for the client and getting paid by the client, he's working for the contractor and getting paid by the contractor. So, and there is a, a confidentiality clause in most of those contracts which stops the architect or structural engineer talking to the client directly about issues affecting the quality of construction. So uh, you'll see in the report that the architect, uh, if you've, uh, it's a long report, I'm sure you haven't read all of it, but um, I recommend it to you. But um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, uh, in one situation, you can see where the architects um, said, pointed out that they were building the inner leaf first and that does lead to, to increase phenomenally the risks of building the, the wall and not getting the joints coursing properly or the ties fixed properly. And um, the architect pointed this out and he showed me emails where he pointed out the contractor. And the contractor decided to ignore that because they wanted to build the inner leaf first to get a dry interior so they could finish the builds a bit quicker and then finish the outside walls later. Uh, and that has led and contributed significantly to the faults that we find in the construction of the building. But the architect didn't have any authority. Now, under the old system, the architect would have said, the specification I wrote says you can only build the walls together and bring them up together so they're tied properly together. Um, but he was overruled by the contractor because he wasn't working for the uh, client, he's working for the contractor. So for clients to think in that situation that they're getting the full benefit of professional technical input is, is a mistake, and I think clients have been led to believe that. They have then stood back and they don't have people representing them or understanding fully uh, the implications of uh, poor construction that can happen as a result. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McKee, do you want to come in at this point? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I, I would very much like to, to pick up on a, a couple of the, the, the points that have been made by uh, Professor Cole, I, I, and, and it relates to uh, the, the placing or, or, or the involvement of uh, professional consultants and professional members of the design team and, and how they have become subservient um, in, in, the, uh, in the project and, and uh, as uh, Professor Cole has said, uh, are, are acting effectively for, for the contractor with no uh, contractual link or, or means of uh, communicating with the ultimate client. Um, to, to our mind, uh, to our ICS mind, uh, this is something that we've we've been talking about, uh, we've been voicing for quite some time, uh, that it is the outcome of uh, the procurement strategies that are being followed. Um, but linking that to, to the issue of, of maintenance, um, I am a chartered building surveyor. Uh, I, there are many different types of uh, chartered surveyor, but as a chartered building surveyor, my principal role is um, uh, appraising existing buildings, so working uh, on existing buildings to maintain them, repair them, uh, refurbish them, uh, and adapt them. And that, that role uh, is, is, is the principal role in, 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 ma in, in maintenance, in assessing uh, what a building needs uh, by way of maintenance over uh, a period of time. Generally, it's a five-year rolling programme. You inspect it, you put together a, a programme of uh, maintenance work, create the budget, agree the budget, and then execute the work, and it rolls on. The problem that we see now that in, in, in common with uh, the uh, making uh, professional consultants subservient and, and, and pushing, pushing them away from the front line is we're dumbing down the professional skills. A lot of these uh, condition type surveys, uh, large scale uh, surveys of portfolios is uh, reduced to a tick box exercise. And, and, and to my mind, that, that, that's, that just can't, can't go on. You need uh, an experienced professional uh, individual who knows uh, the, the building to get in there and, and really investigate the building as part of the, uh, the maintenance survey, the maintenance inspection. And it's only by doing that that you get to the heart of what, uh, how the building's built, how it's deteriorating, because all buildings, new, new buildings, old buildings, they all deteriorate I mean, from, from day one. Maintenance starts from the, 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 the day after practical completion, if you like. So you really do need that level of diligence uh, and uh, expertise in there. And as Professor Cole says, that, that, that comes with a price because it takes time. It, it, it takes quite a lot of time. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr Fields, do you have any idea of what head teachers think of all this? Um, I come at this from a, a kind of different perspective from my colleagues and I am at the, the, the sharper end of this and having read Professor Cole's report, I have to say felt rather kind of really quite scared by what was happening there because 
Head teachers take over school buildings on the basis of trust that they are fit for purpose. Professor Cole's report highlights entirely and consistently the, the, the kind of missing link between contractor and client. Can I substitute the word head teacher for client? In that there's an expectation from parents, and there's an expectation from society out there that young people, when they are sent to school, will be educated in a safe environment. And all the way through Professor Cole's report, there is nothing there to give me confidence in a great many occasions across the country. And reading the reports which have come in from the local authorities across the country, that, that is consistently the case. Other point to be made within that context is that you were talking here about a wall which was blown down on account of structural work which was not done. What else exists out there within schools in relation to the safety in which we are educating young people? There's a huge question to be asked around about that, whether you know, the roof is secure enough to stay on. Are the fire break procedures within the school sufficient to stop a fire within school? And you could go on uh, down that line. So, the link between contractor and client has got an absolute and definite impact on the way in which young people are educated within schools. We're expected to educate them. We're expected to look at an environment which is comfortable, safe and ongoing, maintained in that sort of a way. So that's the first part. Second part is very much in relation to ongoing from here, and Liz Smith has touched on the whole notion of maintenance and ongoing within maintenance. One of the things which came out of it, and we were directly as an association involved in it at the time, was the, the lack of a contingency for when things went wrong. And the notion of, you know, kind of worst case scenarios where during a summer holiday when staff are not in schools, we kind of bore greatly on the significance of what happened within Edinburgh. But uh, bearing in mind what the local authorities have said out there in relation to what might be the case within 32 local authorities within Scotland, I ask the question, you know, what is the, the contingency view in relation to any other defects which come along? Another aspect to this, and you know, I'm sitting here at Education Skills Committee. Been at previous uh, Education Skills Committees where we talked about training of young people, developing the young workforce, training young people to contribute to the workforce meaningfully within Scotland. And some of the, the, the comments made throughout the report in relation to the level of training and skill which young people, older people perhaps, were bringing into the workplace has been has had an impact on what has been going on here. And it might well be worthy of a kind of further explanation and discussion at some other time around the, the whole training regime and the way in which we look at a skilled workforce coming into all aspects of Scottish industry. OK, thanks very much for that. Can I just briefly... Just add to that slightly, yes, yes, uh, if you don't mind. Um, one of the th problems with the fact that a lot of public bodies have done away with their own in-house clerker works over the years, uh, they used to have bodies of them there protecting them in this way, and uh, secondly, they're not using them within the contracts uh, because of this issue of contributing negligence. As a result of that, there's less opportunities for Clarker Works. And I, somebody advised me, and I need to look into this in more depth, about the lack of availability now of courses to actually get qualified Clarker Works. Mm -hmm. So we're actually, because we're not using it, the skill is dying. And that's the skill which was fundamental to the problems that we have here. So from a skills perspective, I think we need to really look at how do you build up a cadre of people with the experience to actually, and those people generally will come from trades within the construction industry, joiners, bricklayers, you know, in the past. And that isn't happening anymore because there's no opportunities for Clarker Works or reduced opportunities for Clarker Works. So the problem is exacerbating itself by the way that public sector bodies procure. Yeah, I, I, I want to ask you one question that, that came from the evidence, and you've probably got it written in your report, so I apologise in advance. But the, the fact that the same fault was so widespread, what do you think was the cause of that? Um, the nature and the way in which bricklayers are paid, the fact that they don't generally belong to organisations, they used to belong to big contractors with really good apprenticeship systems. Uh, they generally now can be just picked up and moved through from project to project. They're paid on the number of bricks they lay. 
um, and where the, the number of bricks they laid does not measure the number of fittings they put in behind the bricks, or the, the rather fiddly fixings. Particularly, we find that uh, where the beams were, as in this case, a sloping beam, to fix the header ties, which were a complicated header tie, into both leaves of the wall and into the header beams has to be drilled. Um, that it takes time. So it means when they're doing that, they're not laying bricks, and they're getting paid on that day on how many bricks they lay. So we find an instance where the fittings that should have been used to tie the building back to the steel beam were actually sitting, left sitting on the flange where the bricklayer left them up there, and no fittings have been put. Because he's getting paid on how many bricks he lays on a day. So there and should be a, a way of, of compensating them for taking the time to do this? Or it should be yes, or, or paying them on time. Yeah. You know, so there's a combination of methods, which I know that some contract, contractors have already, not just on the basis of support, because some were doing it before, changing the way in which they're trying to uh, pay uh, bricklayers. One or two con contractors have told me they've actually changed the way they're paying them to reflect the fact that they should have time to, f to, to, to do the rest of these fittings. That's great. Gillian, you wanted to come in briefly here? Yeah. yeah, what's been in my mind <clears throat> the whole time that I've been listening to you is that there's other sectors where there's really stringent health and safety procedures. I'm thinking of like oil and gas, obviously the very profitable area. Uh, of work, so that you know they can put the, those. You know, as a result of like the Cullen report, they completely overhauled the way things were done. So my first, my first question is: Do you think that this issue is um, of a gravity that we need to be looking at having an overhaul of how health and safety works within the construction industry, and almost having a, a, a an accreditation regime? Yeah. That people cannot enter this until they have a certain amount of uh, training well, in that respect? In theory, um, well, first of all, just health and safety can be a confusing issue. Um, health and safety within the industry has vastly improved over recent years due to the card system that has been brought in, the mandatory training for everyone, including anyone coming to the site. They have to go through health and safety training in terms of working on the building. So the risks to workers on site have dramatically reduced and the number of incidents is dramatically reduced. That's to the workforce, the building workforce. Mm -hmm. The safety of people subsequently using the building, if that's yeah. what we're talking about, you know, mm -hmm. the safety of features, that comes back to the, the quality of the building built. And the building regulations are there to protect that. The problem is there's nobody ensuring at the sufficient level of detail that the building regulations, which followed completely, would provide all the safety you need in the design of buildings, fire protection, etc. Uh, there's nobody, uh, in many cases, uh, applying sufficient scrutiny to ensure that they're being complied with. So the building control receives now a certificate, which is given by the contractor, and building control now have only to just to show themselves that it's reasonable to sign that. In the past, it was the responsibility of building control to go out and to take the lead in that. Mm -hmm. But even in that situation, the number of visits by building control officers and the number of building control officers around, and secondly, just for a digression, the skills, I've had problem, people saying the problem is actually recruiting building control officers with the skills is now a problem, and the courses for those in Scotland are actually reduced as well. So there's, there's a real issue there. Nobody is doing the checking. The, the, the regulations are there. Mm -hmm. This is the issue. Of, this is a question about application of appropriate scrutiny. Right. So that effectively, we have got things in place already that just have not been followed, and there's no scrutiny yeah. of them. Right. Okay. Dan. Thank you very much. Um, firstly, can I just begin by saying this is an issue that has very much impacted my constituency. The catchment area for ox gangs uh, is significantly within Edinburgh Southern. Uh, St Peter's Primary was another of the pre affected primary schools, and, and Liberton High School uh, had to. Uh, 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 host uh, Grace Mount High School for a significant period of time. Um, can I just start? Uh, I'm really interested in the, the quality assurance process. And I think, uh, Professor Cole, you've, you've outlined, I think, quite well that the, that the fundamental problem is, is, is the collapsing of the responsibility for the designing and then the, the building of, of the schools. Now, if, if that's the case, the design build model would be just as prone to these sorts of issues as, as schools built under PPP and PFI. Absolutely. Is that correct? Design and build is a subset of PPP. <clears throat> you know, the, the, the owners of um, PPP schemes, the, the special companies, you know, the, the funding companies, etc., they're not builders, they just go to a builder. Yeah. But the, the general model is that that builder will then employ the design team. So the, the design and build is, is a standard model for any PPP scheme. 
So, so it's a subset of it. It's not different to it. It's just a subset so of it. So there's a number of procurement routes which could have used public money and, and, and led to exactly the same issues. Many, as many do. Many of these faults will be found in design and build schemes where, where there's been no PPP involved. The money, as I said before, really doesn't have too much to do with it. Um, I'm also very interested in, in, in uh, the, the, the RICS submission. Um, and can I just quote from it? It says, relegating the uh, regulated independent professional consultants to subsort, that subservient uh, role on many occasions reduces the quality of construction. This is prevalent in PFI, PPP, and more recently, hub projects. I mean, that suggests this is a very significant ongoing issue rather than historic issue. I mean, how, how seriously should we take this as, a, as an ongoing issue in, in public buildings uh, generally? Extremely seriously. Uh, not having the, the professional design team at the forefront of, of, of building projects uh, is foolhardy in my view. Uh, you, the, the, uh, the design team, whether that's made up of the architect or, or uh, engineers and, and surveyors, re really do need to have uh, a contractual link to, to the ultimate client. Uh, whatever the, the uh, procurement method, uh, some, some means of, of keeping those uh, professional consultants who are the regulated. The, the, these are the individuals who are insured, regulated, working to uh, very high uh, professional standards. Um, keeping them uh, with a contractual link to the ultimate client. I mean, can I ask, I mean, to what extent is there a fear from the, the panel that actually there is a very large number of undiscovered faults in public buildings built under both Hub and PFI PPP? That, that we don't know about. I, I would actually, it's impossible to answer, but given the frequency that we've found it where we've looked, I think if you open, you will find, you know, and it's an unfortunate that based on the evidence we have to date, just based on the law of averages, you know, um, on what has been opened up, believe me, find to say, a, a colleague of mine in London yesterday, uh, they built two schools and the contractor decided to open one in the basis report and find a wall with no... You know, that, I, was, I, I hear that all the time. And it's not schools. This is, this is buildings. This is, what we're talking here about is walls. You know, I think that needs to be forgotten. You know, it's, it's just walls. You know, yeah. The wall in a leisure centre or a fire station or a hospital or if it's a panel wall built to the same instruction, it's nothing to do with schools. You know, that, the, we've called it the schools of quarry, but this is actually about, about construction. Um, the, the other point I'd just like to, 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 to maybe add slightly to, 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 to interview, in that even if you have the architect working for the client, you know, unless the architect is going to the site or, or appropriately, you know, and regularly and inspections, and generally that will happen maybe weekly or you know on a on a on a site. If you have a resident architect on the site on bigger sites, I would have used that many times, but. In all cases, they still need the eyes and ears of somebody walking around the site mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's back to the clock of works. It's not necessarily you know, the issue. To have somebody independent of the contractor able to say that isn't good enough, and then for him to be able to go and say to a professional architect or engineer, you can now issue an instruction to take down that wall and rebuild it. Very key point. The Clark of Works is an important rule which has been eroded and, and, and lost over, over time. I mean, uh, 20, 30 years ago, certainly uh, as I started in the in the profession, it, you, you you came across Clarker Works fairly regularly. But I, I would I would say now I very infrequently come across a Clark of Works. It is important though that, that Clark of Works, from wherever they're drawn, uh, uh, their their skills match the. The, uh, the, the building that they're, they're working on, the project they're working on. Now, Clark of Works nowadays can be drawn from, from the trades, but it, it could also be uh, drawn from uh, colleagues of mine building, building surveyors. The key thing is that they need to be reporting to, uh, to the professional design team. Traditionally, historically, they've, they've, uh, um, they've reported to the architect, but now you don't have the architect at that level. The architect has been removed. So uh, having the Clark of Works report to, to whom? To, to the to the builder, the agent, the professional employer's agent. Yeah. So the, the, on the employer side, you have to have that uh, architect or uh, 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 senior professional for for the clerk of works to, to to respond to. But just picking up on the the, the point about uh, building control, I think you know, and and also uh, your know, professional skill. What what's happening here and what's happened over the years is a, a an erosion of uh, professional skill. We 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 have a chronic skills. Uh, uh, crisis at, at the moment. We're not attracting uh, young people into the built environment. We're not attracting them into the professions. 
And uh, we, we have a lot of people uh, uh, retiring out over the, the next 10, 15 years, just by the way the demographics are, and also the, the impact of the, the financial crisis. So we have a, a very big hollowing out of, of experience uh, w within, uh, within the profession. So we need to turn that around. Uh, we can't turn it around if actually all, all the, the professionals are being asked to do is uh, up to uh, pre-contract work do the design and then not see the, the, the construction work through because they, they gain no experience. If you're not on site seeing the thing built, interacting with the, the contractor and, and, and the, the other professionals, you, you don't know what a, a, a properly built wall looks like. So we have an, a number of, of problems converging here. Yeah. Uh, I think the general model we're using is actually de-skilling the professionals, the industry as a whole. Can I one last question. One last question, and, and can we start to keep our questions and, and answers short? I, I think most people would be pretty shocked that building control doesn't ensure that buildings are safe, whether they're schools, office blocks, or whatever. I mean, do you agree that that, that is shocking? And secondly, do you think there should be a statutory requirement to have a clerk of works for public buildings? I'm not sure if it should be a statutory requirement, but it should be a good practice requirement um, that they should, and one looks at, at issues. And the other thing is about the number of clerker works and how much time they spend on site. The issue about building control, um, I don't think that based on the time that they actually spend, the number of officers, that any local authority could ask them to guarantee that a building is built properly. If they're going there once uh, a week or once a month or, or, or whatever it is, that will never be enough unless you spend a lot, lot more, in which case you'd have to increase significantly the building control charges to pay for that. But isn't that what, exactly what we should be doing? You should be getting Clarker Works and, uh, and architects certifying and going to building control and saying, we have certified this because we've had put the right time in. I don't think you're, it's really practical for local councils to take on that supervision job. They, they really should be there to be able to affirm based on strong evidence from independent uh, professionals that the work has been carried out properly. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Colin? Thank you, Vera. Um, I feel that the bit that we're really dancing around here is the fact that uh, subcontractors and to some extent presumably the main contractors have seen a weakness in the system and they've exploited it to cut corners. That's what it seems like to me. Would you agree? Unfortunately, in some cases, that is the, is the case. I, would, I don't think they intentionally set out to cut corners or anybody intentionally sets out to build something badly. But by cutting the, qual the cost of the quality assurance elements, by not having the proper staff, by not having the professionals on site or the clerk or works, we, we are not investing in the quality assurance. So we have cut corners, and that push has come from clients, uh, not just from contractors. The public sector have sought to reduce costs and come under pressure to reduce cost of fees. Uh, fee bidding uh, by professionals, and I'll, I'm, I am an architect, I don't fee bid, so, but I'll, I'll tell you that some of the bids submitted now by professionals to win work are totally inadequate for them to properly carry out the, amount, the, the required work that they do. And that's a system that we still allow to happen. And if you talk to any group of professionals, that's the feedback you would get from them now, that quite often they're taking work and they really just cannot afford to put the time on. That was the evidence given to the inquiry by people. And so you're saying, if I, sorry. If I might come in on that, uh, and, and that's, that, when that happens, uh, to, to square the circle, if you like, services get cut. Uh, you know, there, there, there'll be a, an agreement between the consultant and the contractor and the post contract, so the construction phase services are the, the things that are likely to get cut to make that fee work. So basically what you're saying is that uh, the fault is right across the system. Totally. Uh, if, you, if you find the report, actually, it starts off with the client in my recommendations. That's where the faults lie. And it goes all the way down to the manufacturer of all ties. So it, it's, it's right down the, the whole system. And we really need to think hard about how we build buildings and the quality of infrastructure that we want to produce. And I haven't touched as an architect with a great passion for high quality design. I have I've only talked in this report about construction standards. There's the issue of design standards and what it can do to enliven lives and make places better and make schools better places for, for kids. That's another area which has also been cut back on through the processes that have been used in the procurement by putting the contractor in charge of selecting the architect and imposing potentially in many cases a design that would be less than optimal because it's better for him to build. If we, if we look at building standards, I've always thought building standards gave some sort of reassurance uh, to the quality of the build and so on. 
But clearly in your report, you're saying it's got no remit to con on, on any sort of quality control practice, and it's not intended to provide protect protection to a client in a contract with a builder. I mean, in that case, what's building standards for? Is it just a tick box exercise? It's a, it's a legal requirement for the developer, for the architect, for the contractor. It doesn't mean anything. To comply. It's only, it's only as good if, you, if, if it's a crime to walk across a road in traffic, you know, and nobody polices it, everybody will walk across a road in traffic. There's nobody effectively policing this, and we need systems which put appropriate attention into policing it because the impact of it not being policed is the ox gang type incident. And there were four earlier collapses of walls in schools in Scotland in the last four years, and the connection was not made prior to the ox gang. Ox gang was the fifth collapse of a wall. We're looking at uh, perhaps one narrow piece here wall ties and walls it's, around it, but it's, just, it's, just, it's just an example of a whole quality issue. Do we, do we have examples of other issues that have arisen because of... Because well, of the, the, other one I, the other one I raised in the report is fire stopping in these schools. Uh, again, areas which are hard to inspect after and uh, that nobody can see and get closed up um, are the ones which are most likely to be skimped on and, uh, because people can get away with it. It's not as obvious and that's where people skimp. So uh, there, is, there are proposals, and I know one of those groups, and I've been encouraged actually by the very positive way the, the Scottish Government has, has, has approached this report and, and the groups have set up and have uh, participated in some of that. Um, there are groups looking at how they can identify the high-risk areas. It's one of the recommendations in the report that we look at the high-risk areas which potentially could have impact on the safety of users and the public in general and see if there's mechanisms we can put into the processes, good standard quality mechanisms that will ensure that those areas are checked, uh, whereas maybe other areas like if, a, if a, the tiles of a floor aren't laid particularly flat, well, you can see that and it's not going to kill anybody unless you trip on the edge of a tile. Uh, but um, the issues that could impact on the health and safety and life of those people using buildings, um, they should be seen uh, with much more um, scrutiny than they are currently. Going back to previous comments, you were talking about the fact that uh, contractors could not deliver at the price that uh, they, were, they were bidding for contracts. I, you know, I didn't say or, that. Or, 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 <laughs> I said, correct, I said yeah. architects couldn't, and professional services couldn't deliver the services in terms of inspection and other right. duties because the fees are being paid, uh, they've bid and been paid at such low levels. So or that's only where the cuts came? Pardon? That's where basically the cuts came to make the contracts yes. viable. Yes. What other areas, I mean, you were talking about uh, ties and such like and other, other areas where, where the defects would be hidden and difficult to find because that's where the contractors tuck mm -hmm. them away. Mm -hmm. What other examples could you give? Well, you start off with foundations. You know, you, you, you never see a foundation. You start with damp-proof courses within buildings. But the, the impact of them might mo be more uh, disturbance and inconvenience and having to close down buildings as opposed to killing people in some instances. But there's lots of pieces of work which are, go out of sight very, very quickly and um, are not properly... Uh, potentially could not be properly inspected, which could impact on safety. Uh, all the mechanical electrical systems through a building, the structure of a building, uh, the, the fundamental structural elements, you know, the, the roofing. Uh, there's, there's lots of areas in a building, and uh, one of my recommendations is that the uh, industry get together from the various sectors, sit down and agree what are those high-risk areas, and then apply a more advanced level of scrutiny than it is currently doing. I realise it's a difficult question to, uh, to answer, but approximately when do you think the change came, that watershed? This has, been, this has been uh, growing over the last maybe 20 years. It's been a movement away from, I, I think, and to be uh, critical of my own profession, um, I think there was some loss of faith in the ability of architects to control price. Uh, I'll say nothing about the building I'm in at the moment, but um, there were questions about whether architects could actually manage you know, projects on behalf of the client. And it was felt that contractors would be much more practical and better at doing this job and getting on with it. With it. And there is some element of truth uh, in that. Uh, the fact is that we had a pendulum which was out there and we swung it and it's way out here. It needs to get back to the middle where we have a balanced approach to these things. Um, so I, I think it's been happening maybe over, over 20 years 
and the development of the project manager role, the non-specific professional who now sort of seems to be representing the client, and the real design professionals are somewhere down in the system with much less influence, despite the fact that they are the people who have the knowledge about what is essential to the health and safety. They are the people who design the building, but they're not allowed in many cases now to even see whether it's been built in line with their specification. And to go back to the building control issue for a moment, Building control spends an awful lot of time on getting warrants approved, you know, getting your warrant signed and all the time looking at drawings. But what's the point in looking at drawings if you look at them and then they go out on the site and the contractor does whatever he wants with them because nobody has it, no, nobody looks at it any further? You know, the focus needs to be on the site we're actually building. I've said to several building control officers I interviewed during the thing that I don't think anybody's been killed by a set of drawings falling on them, but they certainly have been by a wall. You know, so you know that's where the real difficulty is happening now. Certainly, we have to inspect that people are building and complying with building regulations in their designs. But we put so much energy into that, and yet it's totally wasted if we don't then go and ensure that actually what has been built on site complies with all those stringent requirements which take months to get approved. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> I think it's, it does seem to me that what we're get, getting told here is it's a false economy to drive down costs within local authorities around inspection regimes and the way in which projects are managed, planning systems, architects or whatever, but that's more general. I wanted maybe to focus in on what it says about the building industry, because we do know historically that you know the level of fatalities amongst construction workers has been high and really not, in my view, taken as seriously as it should in terms of the scandal it represents. Um, but what seems to be suggested here is if you don't police these people, they will just do whatever they like. Now, there is a level at which it's impossible to police yes. and folk have to self-police. I wonder whether, yeah. um, do you not think from the Building Federation that this is really a bit of a damning re um, review which says unless you nail these people down, they will hide their work? I think, and I've used the phrase um, um, very uh, intentionally, I said you should apply appropriate scrutiny based on the level of risk of the event happening. So if you find that having placed your faith, which the procurement models have, in contractors building it properly and doing the quality assurance bit on behalf of the client, and finding that that is not there, then you, you, you'd be, be stupid to continue doing our process. At that point, you have to apply the scrutiny and be, do the policing and increase the policing in the areas where you find that that, that it isn't working. So that's what, we, that's what this has shown, that, that in the areas of the management of quality of bricklaying across Scotland, we've found major deficiencies. Uh, builders have been charged and held the responsibility for building those walls. It's the contractor's responsibility to build them. But it's the client's responsibility in the public sector to ensure that a builder who he's paying is building it properly. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the builder, it's the whole system uh, I is, is at fault. I, I appreciate that and, and the complexities of that. But it just feels to me, if you, as a builder, are building a wall and you just miss out the bit where it's all tied together, at what level are you aware as a professional of what you're doing, or a, you know, as a, is it because it's subcontracted down so far, the gap between actually laying the brick and what you're building is even lost? Uh, I'm, I'm not quite no, following. Um, yeah. Sorry? Paul, would you like to so, from, from my um, perspective, that I think we've got to be very careful not just to point the, the finger of blame here at the, the bricklayer who's at the, the, the kind of cold face, if you like. Um, obviously, there, there are issues there if they are deliberately cutting corners, but I think we have to look at the wider uh, context, the wider culture, that the, the, the wider system that, that they are operating in. Um, from, from my perspective, um, I, I have a particular focus on, on uh, the kind of people issues rather than uh, the technical issues, which my, my colleagues to either side might be better placed to, to to, to uh, advise on. Um, from, from my perspective, th there are four um, main people issues. First of all, the, the level of training that uh, the tradesperson receives initially, which is generally the, the, the apprenticeship. Uh, second of all, we, I think we have to look then at um, the levels of continuous professional development. Uh, many bricklayers will, will, will pass their apprenticeship and can go through a whole career. Um, almost without receiving any technical training on, on bricklaying. I'm sure they will receive um, 
plenty of health and safety specific um, training, but there is no requirement for them uh, post completion of the apprenticeship to do any continuous professional development um, whatsoever. Uh, so I think that's a, 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 an issue. Uh, thirdly, I think we have to, to look at the levels of independent um, supervision and scrutiny of their work, and I think uh, Professor Coles um, explained that bit better than perhaps I could. Um, but lastly, it's, it's the way in which the, the tradespeople are engaged with, and um, the um, perhaps the employment contract, or the, the labour-only subcontract, or um, people operating on a, a self-employed basis. And allied to that, you have the way in which they are paid and remunerated. And again, Professor Cole dis described um, the circumstances whereby bricklayers are often paid, paid by the amount of, of bricks that they lay, uh, rather than the quality of their work. Now, to, to my mind, if we create a situation where we uh, give very little in the way of continuous professional development, create a perverse incentive to uh, pay bricklayers to uh, leave bricks rather, rather than quality, and then we, we have a very uh, laxadaisical level of supervision. I don't think we should be surprised if that cocktail combines to create the difficulties that have been seen in, in this particular report. Okay. I mean, to be clear, I wasn't pointing the blame at individual bricklayers, sure. because I think I'm interested in the culture or yeah. on, in you know, what kind of pressures there are on somebody just to get through that, and I think there's maybe needs more understanding of that. Specifically in your evidence, you talked about the dilution of the school's agenda around apprenticeships, sure. and that actual current qualifications aren't given the kind of guarantees, I suppose, of the autonomy of the tradesperson you might have had in the past. I wonder if you want to say something about that, because we, I think that's something we might want to explore further. If we're, even while we're providing apprenticeships, they're not creating the skilled the skills that we could then have confidence in to resist some of the perhaps the broader pressures that are on an individual tradesperson when they're doing their job. Yeah, um, thank you for the for the opportunity to, to speak about the, the apprenticeship qualifications. Um, I think that will be the, the main uh, focus of, of my contribution to the to the committee today. I think first of all, in terms of the, the technical aspects of the the bricklaying um, apprenticeship, we have uh, asked Professor Cole to come and meet with. Um, industry representatives and college lecturers to identify any technical shortcomings in the curriculum, if you like, of the bricklaying apprenticeship. And uh, thankfully, Professor Cole is coming over to speak with us next week to, to kickstart um, that, that process. Um, the, the concerns that we, we raised um, in, our, in our evidence are in relation to the renewal of the SVQ qualification, SVQ level three qualification that a craft apprentice would um, receive, in, including bricklayers. Um, uh, unfortunately, we have sustained uh, a significant level of frustration over the last eight or nine months um, in terms of working with our partners, uh, firstly, at the Scottish Qualifications Authority, SQA, uh, and secondly, with um, our Sector Skills Council, CITB, who have been uh, ineffective in uh, representing the industry's views. Um, so, if I could take the um, SQA uh, initially, if, if you would allow. Um, the, um, l last year, they unilaterally made a decision that the skills test was to be removed from the, the SVQ qualification. Uh, as many people may know, the skills test is a, a, the, the end test, uh, if you like, that a craft apprentice must pass in order to be uh, certificated. Um, they uh, then made a decision to unilaterally introduce portfolios of evidence uh, to the SVQ qualifications without any prior discussion or dialogue with the industry. Uh, they also terminated uh, a successful joint uh, awarding arrangement with the industry. Um, so all SVQ craft certifications, uh, certificates carried uh, an industry logo as well. Um, and, and that was terminated without any justification still being given to the industry for uh, those actions or any indication on how the relationship is going to move forward from here. Uh, and lastly, they are uh, now looking at introducing SVQ Level 2 qualifications in uh, what are sometimes referred to as the, the biblical crafts, which again include, includes um, bricklaying. Uh, there has been no consultation with the industry in relation to the introduction of those level two qualifications. Um, 
the body that, that I represent, SBTC, uh, as a combination of employer representatives, trade unions and uh, employers directly, and they very much see the introduction of Level 2 qualifications as a, a dilution of the, the uh, skill base and the, the biblical crafts. So the SVQ Level 3 qualifications are broad-based. Uh, candidates would learn every aspect of, of bricklaying, for example, or carpentry and joinery, or painting and decorating. Uh, level 2 qualifications uh, have a much more uh, narrow focus and may concentrate on one or two aspects of each of those of those crafts. Uh, so there's a concern in the industry that we would lose uh, what's normally referred to as labour market elasticity and the ability from candidates to move from one job to another. We'll, uh, we'll be writing to SQA to ask them to respond to the comments that you've made. This. Yeah, I, I would really appreciate if, if you did. We, 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 uh, we, we've really struggled with, with SQA over the last eight or nine months. They, they seem to be reluctant to, to listen to, to the industry. Uh, and again, it's, it's a collaborative voice that we're speaking with. It's trade unions and employers and trade federations. Okay. Um, I, I think um, allied to that, we have sustained difficulties with our, our sector skills council, um, CITB who have, um, in my view, not properly represented the views of, of industry. So with, without wanting to get uh, too uh, far into the technical aspects of the qualification, uh, we managed to overturn SQA's decision to uh, reject the, the practice of skills testing, which has been successful in Scotland now for, for 30 years. Uh, it took us six months to be, to be able to do that. Um, but the, the, the Sector Skills Council then wrote uh, an assessment strategy, which is a document outlining the processes to, to undertake skills testing. And the way that that document has been written, it would essentially allow colleges to appoint their own skills test assessor, uh, perhaps to mark their, their, their own homework in a way, rather than having an independent level of oversight from industry, whereby skills test assessors are put, appointed from industry independently by SBTC and then allocated Maybe, Mr. to Mitchell, colleges. Maybe, Mr Mitchell, you could write to us with sort of the, the detail of this and then we could take that up with both those bodies because it does yeah, sure. it if, sound like an issue. Uh, I, I, I would certainly like to, to, to do that and I, I'm more than happy to do that. If I could finish just very briefly by saying uh, the arrangements for skills testing uh, are, are now such that they, they would undercut the collectively bargained terms of the um, of, of apprentices. So construction apprentices in Scotland are all protected by collectively bargained arrangements. Um, the, the details of the skills testing would, would undercut that. They would also undercut um, the, the time-served period of apprenticeship. And they would also allow candidates to get the SVQ Level 3 qualification out with apprenticeship. So you could simply uh, complete a portfolio uh, and, then sub uh, and then be coached to pass the skills test, and you could be on a building site working on a school um, and so sometime soon, and I think we'd all seek to, to avoid that process. Uh, the, the latest update that, that we have is the industry, again, collectively, federations, trade unions, employers, have written to SQA to say that we, don't, we do not uh, wish for the revised craft qualification SVQs to be accredited. We've written to the Modern Apprenticeship Group to say that we do not believe that uh, the revised modern apprenticeship framework and the, the biblical crafts should be uh, re-accredited. Um, we've written to CITB uh, to express uh, our concerns in the way that the Sector Skills Council is behaving. Um, that letter is, is, is signed by employers who, who <coughs> recruit or are currently training uh, up to 1,000 apprentices uh, per year. So we really are in a concerning situation at the moment that from uh, 1st of September onwards there may not be an SVQ uh, qualification or a modern apprenticeship framework for uh, the candidates in the biblical crafts to actually be trained in. Okay, that, uh, thanks very much for that. Uh, Joanne's yeah, got just, just to say, I mean, I think it would be worthwhile speaking to construction unions around this issue as well, because there must be a question about how that then impacts parts of their members in terms of their confidence to take on these questions in, in the actual on-site. But I suppose what I would be interested in, and maybe it's not for now, but for you know, to reflect on, is there's very specific, very specific issues that you're talking about, about right now about training, but presumably a lot of the people who are on site have been trained over a longer period of time, and is there a general dilution of skills training over a longer period of time that may has led to this position? Um, and it's not something you can answer now. It might be some quite interesting to look at, you know, having moved from 
what would have been regarded very high quality craft apprenticeships, is there, for no understandable reasons, addition changes to that? What are those changes? What the impacts of them have been? Sure, I, I can give a, 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 perhaps a short uh, answer to, to, to that question. The, the, the craft um, apprenticeships in Scotland are, are still, um, the, the candidates still achieve an SVQ level three apprenticeship in, in, in Scotland. Um, in comparison, south of the border, typically it's an SVQ level, or an NVQ level two qualification. Uh, in Scotland, we have fixed four year term apprenticeships. That's not customary south of the border. We have standard terms and conditions for all of the apprenticeships. That's not customary south of the border. We have a final skills test in Scotland. Again, uh, that, uh, England uh, are, are maybe introducing that with trailblazing apprenticeships south of the, south of the border uh, at the moment. So uh, construction apprenticeships are, are not perfect by, by any stretch of the imagination. And I think this report has highlighted some areas where, where we need to improve the technical uh, content of, of the curriculum. but. Uh, certainly, when I speak to my counterparts south of the border, they are often envious of the apprenticeship arrangements that we have uh, here in Scotland. They are internationally recognised and sought after. Um, and, and, and my concern is that the, the developments from SQA and CITB are going to, going to undermine that objective. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just... Add to that slightly. One of the, the things that kept recurring in the uh, presentations we had as part of the inquiry was the uh, recognition and statement by every main contractor who came to talk to us uh, that there was uh, great difficulty in getting uh, highly qualified, highly experienced bricklayers in the industry. And that was part of their problem now. And this is to do with the boom and bust nature of our economy, um, partly to do with the seasonal issues in, in, in Scotland when times of year is very difficult to build bricks in. Um, but that there has been a loss, and particularly the last time, there's a huge dip in the economy. So many people left the industry and haven't come back. And with that dearth, I think we're in problems. I, I'll not get into the, the, the uh, more difficult area of um, Brexit, but um, there has been at least 8 uh, to 10% of all skills in the industry have been coming from Europe over this last while too. So with that issue, with a fall off in the in the apprenticeships, with a, a reduction in the workforce to, due to the boom bust situation we find ourselves in, I find the industry is in a particularly bad position at the moment. Um, just to touch briefly on the point that Paul made about the, uh, the, the the course itself, I think we did ask on the as part of the inquiry about the skills test. And we find that it, it didn't really extend much beyond the simple building of relatively plain walls and didn't really get into the real fundamental relationship between brick accessories, structural brick accessories of the type that have failed and their importance in the totality of the scheme of things. And again, to criticise architects and engineers, we also find that the information that bricklayers are given when they go on site isn't probably in the best format. So they're really pointed at the wall and say, you start there and you end there. And quite often the information is on four or five different documents, different specifications, engineers, drawings, architects, drawings. So the industry doesn't make it easy for bricklayers coming on board. So there's problems at all levels in the industry where this quality issue has just uh, been squeezed. Okay, thank you. Tavish, you wanted to come in. Yeah. Thank you. I just want to ask a couple of supplementary questions to Joanne Lamont's first two questions. And I'm sure I'm going to, my fears are going to be groundless here, although I'm very taken with what Daniel was asking earlier on about the scale of the problems you've established. It's not just about schools, it's about every bit of wall that goes up around the country. Um, in your experience, tie rods to hold walls together are in the specification. Well, totally. So what the heck happens? Nobody watches to see that they go in. But there's not an institutional sense that they're deliberately being left out because somebody is trying to skimp on a contract price. No, a couple of instances I reported, and we've just I told you of instances, and we find in Scotland also gable walls with no ties in them. Yeah. Um, one particular instance um, given by Clark of Works working in another sector, not school sectors, uh, said that they actually found a builder, a bricklayer, building a wall with no ties because he was only there on material, he was only there on labour only, and the contractor had not provided enough ties to build into the wall, and he was going to be paid in the number of bricks he laid. Mm -hmm. So he just went on laying the bricks. Now, in that particular situation, there was a clerk of works on the job, and the clerk of works found this out, stopped it, the wall was taken down again. Mm -hmm. If there had been no clerk of works in that job, that job would be like many of the walls we find where there'd be no ties in it. 
And that was because the bricklayer, had, or the bricklayer said, I'm not responsible for buying the ties, and I can't stand around here because I'm getting paid for how many bricks I lay, so I'm going to lay the bricks anyway. But the bit I'm struggling with is the, the specification says there must be tie rods. Totally. The industry knows that's how you build a wall, and yet it doesn't happen. That's the bit well, I just does, don't sorry, understand. It does happen. Uh, let, let's be fair. The number of occasions at which there's uh, wall ties left out is relatively infrequent. You will get some missing, but the problem is, is the level of embedment. Um, if, if, if that's your yeah. wall, and this is a brick tie, yeah. and it's joining the outside wall to that, the requirement is it goes at least 50 mil into the wall. Sure. What we were finding was, in many instances, it was just touching the wall, or not built into the wall at all, mm. or sitting in the cavity, or in some cases missing. The issue in the Ox Gang School was lack of embedment. Mm -hmm. They were just sitting generally, you know, you can see the, the figures are given yes. precisely in the report. Yeah. They weren't embedded. So if they're only sitting tightly in that and the wind pulls a wall, it'll come off. Yeah. They need to be bedded a minimum yeah. under the regulations. It's a statutory requirement. It's not just a specification mm -hmm. requirement mm -hmm. um, of uh, 50 mil and recommended 65 mil. But uh, in many cases, we find that wasn't the case. They were just sitting there or they weren't there at all. And that's your clock of works point. That's that where that a clocker works. That's what he would look at. But yes. the building, the quality surveyor, the quality inspector for the contractor should be doing that. Should, be, doing that. should be supervised by the contractor employing the, the subcontractor. And that wasn't happening. Yet the procurement models are putting their faith in contractors doing that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Jolene? Yeah. To pick up, going back to the, I suppose, the financial implications of this. Obviously, safety is the number one concern about what's happening here. But there's also, given that these schools have been built with a great deal of public money, um, see at the at, at point, I don't know if you can help me, but at the point at which decisions was, was made about creating new estate for, for, for local authorities, school estates, was PFI the only game in town at that point? In the, in the case of the 17 schools in Edinburgh, it was the only game in town because they were told they would not get capital funding from the government to build it and the schools were falling down around them and were no longer fit for purpose. So what I say in my analysis is, well, that was a source of money. They were also told by the government they would get £6 million a year towards the, avenue, uh, the, the revenue payments on that PFI, which made it affordable to the council. And it was the only way they tell me they could have got it. They're not allowed to borrow independently. They have to get the money through government. So um, if government wasn't able to give that money, and government has used PFI as a way of getting many things done and getting many things done very well, in instances road building, you know, other areas have been, have been done generally very well. Whether you pay more for it than you would if you had the money yourself and did it, it's probably the case you will do. Uh, but um, if you people pay interest on mortgages because they want the house, they don't want to wait until they've saved up the few hundred thousand pounds of buy a house. So that's the way government has been acting uh, for many years now since PFI came in. Uh, it's no longer waiting until it has the money itself, it's borrowing the money. And the PPP system has been derived from that. I don't see a problem with the concept of borrowing the money. It's the lack of good quality, quality mechanisms within the procurement processes in the contracting, in the design, and the supervision of the work. And that's where money has been piled out of it, the squeezes on that to increase profits within the system. Mm. Yeah. So is there a risk that some of these school buildings are not going to be long, uh, fit for purpose and the local authorities are still going to be paying them off at a point at which they might have to be well, the, the thing about, built or the, the thing about the nature of the work that we, we looked at and, and uh, that if you're talking about the brick issues as a main issue, you can't tell after the event whether the wall is safe or not until, until it happens. falls. So we've, we've had five falls in the last four years in, in walls for these reasons in Scotland that we know of. Not everybody reports falls because people don't want the bad publicity and they, the companies will tidy it up quickly. And so schools, I'm sure, don't want that parents know that there's a risk in their schools. Not, not, not quite so sure on that part. Yeah. But the, there's a difference between the social responsibility of a school and a head teacher and the relationship the head teacher has with the school community. That's yeah. a totally different relationship. Yeah. But there is a generality that the councils, certainly, and we felt that there was some hesitancy in terms of giving information to the inquiry at the start 
from local councils who didn't necessarily want their school to be talked about. They were hoping to manage it appropriately within their own uh, situation. So if it's to do with the collapse of walls, unless they've gone through the processes of checking that we're recommending in the report um, and uh, then made good any defects, there's always a risk. And I'm sure that as, as many buildings have been checked, I'm sure that that is the case. It can happen again, but I don't know the frequency with which it will happen. The other thing is there's a thing called safety factors in the design of, of all structures. So a wall will sit there generally of its own volition, you know, unless something happens to it. So uh, you need a wind or some other factor, you know, and if, if so many walls which aren't built right because they haven't been subjected to the maximum wind loading um, are still there. Mm -hmm. But if you were to get increasing storms and, and areas uh, which have been there, you could get walls coming down. So when a defect has been discovered in a particular school, What's done to look at the, well, take me through the procedure, but what would be done to look at the rest of the school estate that was built at the same time or by the same contractor? Or, you know, what uh, happens? We, we asked all local authorities, and the Scottish Futures Trust asked all local authorities to examine their schools and to take a risk based analysis process as to if they find, if you looked and found, then look further. You know, if you do sufficient initial checks and find it is safe enough, then. It's probably reasonable to stop. Edinburgh are still doing that on their other buildings, and I think it's in the press that another four buildings were found this week, uh, which had the same defects. And, and um, how independent are those inspectors? Sorry. How independent are those inspectors? Totally, you know, because it's been done by the council. It's not done by the people who yeah. built the, the schools. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Claire. Thank you, convener, and thank you, panel, for some really quite compelling evidence this morning. Um, I suppose I want to pick up a little bit on, on what uh, Gillian Martin was saying there, and, and I asked the panel whether they consider that the inspection activity in relation to the specific problems identified in Edinburgh um, is adequate across the school estate and widen that out to, to other facilities in Scotland. Do you want me to take that in, or do you want to go? Yeah. I, I haven't been involved in, right. in the inspections well, at all. Um, I am aware and have seen um, responses from each of the local authorities I wrote to. I wrote to all local authorities as part of the inquiry and asked them to report to me all incidents that they had found. Um, at that time, at the time of the report, people were still doing some of these exercises, and I say Edinburgh are still doing testing. So I can't possibly comment on how comprehensively the local authorities have done that. I know they have been asked to, to test in a rigorous fashion. Um, it, it's impossible to say, and I think predominantly the focus has been on the school's estate, whereas this is an issue of construction of walls, and those walls could be in any public building or any private building. You know, so uh, I, we, we, we just don't know. I think what we're saying is that um, People need to take reasonable responsibility as, as owners of buildings and the public sector particularly takes, I think there's an onerous duty on them to do this, to look properly at their facilities and, and, and ensure for themselves and confirm back to their constituents that they have done this. Um, the main issue in my mind is looking forward to say that we should ensure that no further buildings are built with this level of defects and risk associated with them. And the measures need to be adopted and enforced by the industry itself, which is taking a very responsible view, I think, in terms of feedback. I've had no, nobody throw a brick at me yet, um, uh, although um, I haven't got back to home yet today, but I'll, I'll see. Um, but um, I think the industry has taken a, a very responsible position in terms of re-examining itself. I don't think there's any option to do. But I think the government and the public authorities and building control and clients have to say, we haven't been doing it properly. We need to take more interest in this and review the procurement models we're using and see how we supplement them with best practice models, which are totally available anywhere. But what you mean is you have to invest in, in quality. You have to invest in assurance. And if the first thing you cut is the assurance checks, the one thing you can be sure is you're not going to get quality. And that's what we've done. Claire? Uh, thank you. So I, I ask here as a parent of a child who attends a PPP school, and I have constituents whose children attend those schools, and I'm sure most of uh, the MSPs around this table have uh, constituents who are attending PPP schools. So we've looked at wall ties, we've looked at header ties, uh, the bed joint reinforcement, the fire stopping. Do we know that's not a, another 
risk of another major defect in schools? Can we get that reassurance? Or can you give that reassurance? I think this, I think this comes back to um, the issue I raised earlier about some sort of um, structured process of determining what were the risk elements in construction, particularly that need to be checked and can be checked. Um, and I think the industry is having that discussion uh, at the moment as to whether it is practical to do so. Some of these things are very, very difficult after, after the event to go back and, and the money involved in taking something apart to prove that it wasn't built wrong in the first place, you know, is, is, uh, isn't really practical either. So it has to be some sort of risk-based assessment with professional guidance. And I think that's the professional guidance that was missing in the first place, maybe, that might have prevented us having to do this now. And how do we get that independent risk assessment of, of the, the, the potential difficulties or dangers that, that are in our schools or, or are, and our other public buildings? Yeah, by removing the potential of conflict of interest, by not having people who are getting paid for doing something, the people who check it. So if you, any school teachers amongst you, particularly here, you don't generally let the kids mark their own homework. You know. That's what, we, that's what we've been doing with the contractors. The, the, sorry. The, there is, and Liz Smith raised this uh, issue earlier on about the, the inspection regime and, you know, not just inspecting educational process, but education, edu uh, inspecting fitness for purpose of educational establishments. Now, there are models out there, and the, the, the chain with what Professor Cole is saying. For example, every year, every school will have a fire risk assessment that will be carried out independently. The local fire service will come in and do that, and they will potentially close down areas of your building if you're not going to conform with what they are saying. So there is a model there which chimes with that independent view of fitness for purpose for a school, any other public building, I suppose. And you know, I would certainly, my organisation, would very much encourage or be involved in encouraging that sort of view of the way in which we examine the school estate. And, and the key, mind you, is not to find it out afterwards, yeah. but to stop it happening yeah. in the first place. And that's where we've been making the shortcuts. Ian. Thank you. I, I, I would uh, pick up on that. Uh, the, the fire risk assessment is, is just one thing that, that needs to be done on, on an annual basis. And we, we've we're focusing here rightly on, on new, new construction and the, the, the failures that are apparent in that. But you know, buildings, whether they're schools, uh, tenement buildings, office buildings, other public buildings, deteriorate, as I, I said earlier. We, we, we need to elevate maintenance and the, the reality that we need to spend a lot of money maintaining our buildings and keeping them safe. We need to elevate that way up the, the, the priority list. I mean, even homeowners, I mean, I, I've done quite a lot of work uh, with the RICS on a policy paper uh, calling on uh, cross-party support uh, to encourage tenemental homeowners to uh, engage with their, their buildings and to maintain them. It's, it's their statutory responsibility. Our intention was to take it from tenement buildings, which is, is the obvious big problem at the moment, uh, to other buildings, and, and schools are no different. We must elevate uh, uh, maintenance uh, uh, up the, the agenda because you know, we can talk about new, new block walls uh, being a potential hazard and danger. A lot of our buildings are over 100 years old and haven't had any level of uh, professional inspection Again, an awful lot of people will turn to a builder to go up and inspect the roof and the chimney um, after high winds. Again, the builder has a commercial interest there. He, he, he's not going to be impartial. So, again, main, maintenance of buildings, whatever they are, whatever age they are, uh, whatever their use is, whatever their ownership is, is an absolutely fundamental uh, issue uh, if we want to keep buildings uh, economically sound and more importantly, safe for their users, uh, their owners, and, and the people who pass by them. Thank you for that. I've got one last question for Jim, but I'm sure that most builders will uh, do the work that's required as opposed to solely be looking to see how much money they can make from, from every call. Uh, Jim, can I ask you, what's the role of head teachers in the, the design process of school buildings? Um, has evolved and has developed over the, the, the phase of PPP and into Scottish Futures Trust. From my own personal experience, 
involved almost integrally, as head teacher of secondary school in Dundee, when we started to look at a redesign of the building. And that was not the sort of common practice in the earlier phases of this. So it's something which in relation to direction of travel, engagement of the head teacher, engagement of the school community through the parent council is becoming much more prevalent just now. It's much more much more of a, a kind of a standard practice than it ever was before, where it was very much, you know, the when a PPP was the only game in town, the contract was for ten secondary schools. What you tended to get was ten secondary schools to a model. It's much more specific now to individual schools and individual school needs. Still direction, still a, a way to go, but much more interactive, much more engaging and much more flexible now than it was. And would you say that that's uniform in terms of the, the, the head teacher, the, the, the school cohort would be involved in the design? In the latest phase of secondary school building, I can't perhaps comment primary school building quite so much, but within secondary school building it has become the norm rather than the exception. Okay, well, listen, uh, thank you very much for that. That was a, a, a really worthwhile session uh, and I really appreciate all your time. We will be, uh, we, we will be taking, we'll be talking about it among ourselves and we'll be deciding what further action to take. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh yeah, we're now going into private session.